Uh, so glad that you're here if you're visiting. Uh, I'm glad that you're visiting with us. Hope you feel at home and welcome because you certainly are. We are not religious nuts. Uh, we are sinners who have found a very loving and gracious God. Uh, I, we've been in a study on the parables, so I'd like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. We'll, we'll have the text on the screens, but if you have a Bible or an iPhone or iPad, you might want to uh, click that up. Matthew 25. Now, when we read this, you're going to have a lot of questions, but we'll get through those, so just set them aside. Matthew 25, Jesus speaking, verse 1. Many of his parables were about the kingdom. Verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten uh, virgins, let's use the term bridesmaids, who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming. There's a sense of delay. And they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out. Here comes the groom. Come out to meet him. Then all the bridesmaids woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourself. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Then Jesus adds, Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Um, you ever have this dream? Uh, I, I dream this sometimes, not very often, but it's a very common dream. Uh, you're in school, you dream you're back in high school or in college or whatever, and, and you show up and you're talking to your friends in class, and then somebody says, are you ready for the test? And, and you think, test? What test? And then you have this panic. Uh, it's a very common... How many of you ever had that dream? Many of you who are uh, uh, having a problem. Um, <laughs> for me, here's a dream. And, and this is, you know, sometimes pastors elaborate or exaggerate. This is not an exaggeration. I have this dream about once every two months. I dream that I'm in this huge church and I, or, a, or at a conference and, you know, and there's the worship thing going on. So I'm standing there, sitting there, worship, not even thinking about anything. And then when the worship is over, this guy comes up or a woman comes up and says, our speaker this morning is Dwight Ford. And then I'm thinking, what? I'm, you know, and then I think, I, but in my dream, I knew I was going to speak. I just didn't think to have it. And so I, and then I look at my Bible, but it's all blurry and I can't, you know, make heads or tails out of it. Uh, as is often the case, and, and, uh, and then I wake up in a, you know, kind of a panic. But, you know, my favorite story about being prepared and unprepared is about a student, and uh, he took a class called ornithology, the study of birds. And it was a very difficult class, and the professor who taught it had the reputation of being a really a tough guy. And so he walks in for the final, the student thinks he's ready, and he's ready to study, but there's, no, uh, there's only one sheet of paper, there's one pencil, there's no blue books, and, and just a, a picture on the wall of 25 birds, and they're numbered. But, but they're not just birds, it's only their feet. And, and, and the professor says, here's your final. You must identify 25 species of birds by just their feet. Well, this kid goes ballistic. And so he goes to the professor and he says, this is crazy. I studied for this final and, and I was prepared, but I can't pass this final. Nobody can pass this final. 
and the professor says, well, you have to take it. I'm the faculty person. I'm the professor. I dictate it. You have to take it. The kid says, I'm not going to take it. I'm not taking the final. And then the professor says, okay, if you don't take it, you're flunked. The kid says, fine, flunk me. Then the professor says, all right, give me, what's your name? And the kid rolls up his pants leg to his knees and says, you tell me. <laughs> First service, crickets. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you're a student, right, it's wise to remember one truth, that a final is coming. It's coming. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it's coming. So be prepared. You don't want to say, if only I would have studied. See, this is a story about a wedding and there are some bridesmaids. And in this story, they have one task. Be ready for the groom. Have oil for your lamps. So, so they, can have, they can light the way and be ready for the festivities. Now, in Jesus' day, you need to understand, a wedding could go on for days. And at the end, on the last day, the groom would come to the bride's home, generally to escort the bride to the final ceremony, and then the celebration. And by the way, this whole story is something that, that people love to hear about. This is a celebration story. And, and that's what's happening here. Before the groom got there, the, we would call the best man would go ahead of him, and our text says he would shout. He would sometimes play a ram's horn. It's called the chauffeur. And, and that's exactly what's going on in Jesus' day. A friend of the groom, he comes out ahead of him and says, look, here's the bridegroom. And he would blow this horn. Come to meet him. And everybody would get all excited. Now, I say that because our weddings are so different. In our day, in weddings, we don't ever talk about the groom. It's all about what? The bride, right? It's here comes the bride, not here comes the groom. She walks down the aisle, and everybody uses the same word to describe a, a bride. She just looks radiant or beautiful. That's fine. Depends on the bride. Um, but it's always that idea. Nobody really notices the groom, right? The groom in our weddings, is, they're like a prop, you know, like candles and music that you just fit up there. Just don't say anything. Just get up there. There's no groom magazine, right? So I just want you to see, by the way, if you're thinking about getting married, that's not biblical. Biblically, we should be focusing on the groom. Here comes the groom. Uh, now, look in verse 5. It says that the bridegroom is delayed. We don't know how long, but not forever. And of course, the story in the bridegroom, the, the groom is about Jesus. Jesus is going to return. And so I also want you to know that when you hear that, some of you people who are really into prophecy, this is not about Jesus coming back in a couple thousand years. It's relevant for us today. The day is coming, Jesus is saying in the story, when justice is going to roll like water. When all the wrongs in this world are going to be made right. The day is coming when we will finally see the truth about this whole world, about all the confusion, about all the mess, about all the questions that you and I secretly have about why the world is not right. It's all going to get sorted out. And everything, New Testament way of saying, everything will be brought to light. We'll see the truth about your life and about mine. And we'll realize that the world is not just an endless, random sequence of events. It's a story, and the story does have an ending. Your life is a story, and so is mine. And our stories will have an ending. They will have meaning, they will have significance, and they will have moral weight. It's all involved with this idea of the return of the groom. Now, in this story, there are people who have oil 
and there are people who don't have oil. And this whole business of oil and lamps, you can understand this is about your life. This is about my life. This is about your character. This is about my character. These bridesmaids had one task, to make sure their lamp was ready, that they had enough oil so they could be a part of the celebration. And the significance of this is that make sure that what Jesus is saying is that you live in such a way that when your life is viewed from God's perspective, and, and that will all be seen when Jesus comes, make sure you live in such a way from an eternal perspective that your life was lived wisely and well. Make sure you gave yourself to that which was worthy and that you didn't get distracted with stuff that is meaningless. Make sure you're ready. Jesus says in verse 6 that the groom is delayed. Nobody knows how long. But when it says at midnight, there was a shout. Maybe it was a trumpet. Now, the word, uh, the word comes, and, and the bridegroom is, is, is returning. Five of the bridesmaids that are present are not prepared. So, they, they, they need oil. So, they ask the, the wise bridesmaids, uh, those that have it, can we borrow some of your oil? And the wise bridesmaid said, no. Now, the thought is here, maybe you think, well, when these are wise girls, why are they so selfish? The, the point of what Jesus is saying and what Greg Keener writes in his commentary, there are some things that can't be borrowed. You, you realize that. A relationship with God cannot be borrowed. Cannot be borrowed from your parents or your children or your friends. You must have that. You must own that yourself. Character cannot be borrowed. Not from your parents, not from your children, or your friends. You're responsible for your character. A life cannot be borrowed. And you're constructing your life. And one day you will stand before God and give an account of your life. And by the way, don't get all fearful and think, oh, I'm heaven or hell. No, no, no. We're talking about counting for the kingdom of God. When you, when you stand before that throne, you will not be able to say to the person behind you, oh, you know, my 20s were really bad. Could I borrow your 20s? And, and, and the point of the oil is this. What does the oil represent? <coughs> and Jesus is driving this home, brutally honest. And here is the truth. And here is the truth that we try to evade. I am responsible to God for my life. I mean, yeah, there are certain factors I can't control. I couldn't control my genes. I couldn't control who my parents were or how I was raised. But there is a little spark that God placed in me. It's called a will that can choose good or evil, love or hate, and by the way, I make those choices a hundred times a day, and I'm knitting every day the fabric of my soul, my life. And I cannot borrow it from anyone else. These bridesmaids are desperate. They're running out of, out of options. And you remember what time it is. It's midnight. So where are they going to get oil? Even the 7-Elevens are now closed. So they discover it's too late. And while the groom was delayed, it seemed like they had all the time in the world. You're thinking you have all the time in the world. But the day is coming for every one of us. Jesus is saying, and we will see this, that time is unspeakably precious and relentless. Now, here's the other thing. Notice, this is not a story about trying to figure out when the groom is returning, right? Look at verse 13. He says, keep awake, therefore. Verse 13, Taylor. He said, my daughter. He says, keep away, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. In, in other words, it's not about going outside constantly as a church and looking to the eastern skies for Jesus. No, being alert, being awake means 
Pursue your transformed heart. Devote yourself to what Jesus said this way, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Seek that first. Make that the priority. He says, do this because the day is coming when everyone will see that that's what really matters. I often talk to a friend of mine about this. I think sometimes when God just sort of reveals himself in a special way to me, I think, oh man, you know, this is so true. I just feel like I didn't, I didn't really commit as much as I should have to this. Five bridesmaids are totally unprepared. Now, how did this happen? How did people end up wasting their lives? Again, Jesus is so wise. I want you to notice the adjectives that he uses in the story. The five without oil, the five who are unprepared, they're not called evil bridesmaids. They're not even called wicked bridesmaids. They're called foolish, just foolish, right? Why didn't you bring oil with your lamp? And if you ask them that, they will answer exactly what my kids would say when they do something crazy. You know, when I say, why did you bring that into here, to the house? Mm-hmm. So if you ask the brides, why did you not bring oil with your lamp? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Higher pitch. <laughs> and, so, and, and that's what I really want you to see. That's how all of us end up wasting our lives. Now, again, throw out the eternity eternity destination. That's not what this is about. This is about kingdom people counting for the kingdom. And many of us waste our lives. These bridesmaids, they weren't defiant. They never shook their fist to God's face and said, I don't care about you. I'm going to walk my own way. Take a hike. They didn't rebel. We don't really rebel. I don't even think they decided. You know what I think they did? They did what I do, just drifted. And Jesus is saying, as a general rule, that's what happens to good church people. They just drift. Not always, but very often. And people get to the end of their one and only life, and if you were to ask them, Why didn't you devote yourself to something that you said was important? Why didn't you lavish love on your children? Why didn't you nurture the spiritual gifts that God gave you? Why didn't you take more risks for Christ and for His kingdom? Why did you spend your one and only life running too fast, collapsed in front of a television, Obsessing over security or pleasure or wealth or power. The groom is coming back. And the answer would be, what my answer usually is, I don't know. I guess at the time it just didn't seem important enough. Other other things that seemed like they mattered more were just easier to do. There's kind of a spiritual complacency that sets in. And as I said, that applies to us as individually, and it can apply to us as a congregation. And by the way, if you get a chance, look at the context. The context from Matthew 24, 42 to Matthew 25 to 30. Read that sometimes this afternoon. There are four parables, and these four parables make the same point. So Matthew is trying to get something across. The, the, the first story is the story of a thief that comes suddenly in the night. And then we have this story about the bridesmaid. And then there's, it's followed by two other stories about a servant whose master suddenly returns. And in every one of them, the same point is made. Don't Live your one and only life in a way that will leave you sane on your deathbed. If only. If only. We don't want to end our lives with a pile of regrets. My favorite psalm is Psalm 90. Moses wrote that psalm. And there's a little line in there that says this. 
Teach me, Lord, to number my days that I may present to you a heart of wisdom. And, and what he's saying is this. When he says, teach me to number my days, he's not, Lord, teach me how to draw a calendar. No, he, he's saying, teach me to number my days. Teach me to know that I'm only on this earth a short time. Teach me to know that that time is very quick. There's an end to my days. And let me see that now so that I can live in light of it. So that I, when I see you, I can present, present to you a heart of wisdom. I, I, I lived a life that was wise. So there's some areas of regret that I think we all have. And I pick these because they hit me. Here's some areas that we probably need to look at when it comes to regret. The first is parents. Parental regret. You remember the story of Eli? It's from 1 Samuel. Eli was a great guy. He was a priest of God. He devoted himself to the people of God. He spent his time in worship and prayer. He taught Samuel how to recognize the voice of God. That's Eli. Everything he did was faithful. But he had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. And these boys were corrupt. They used the temple to steal money that belonged to God. They used their status as religious leaders to exploit and seduce women. Women who came to church intended to serve at the temple. They were, they were seduced and led into sexual sins by these two young men. Now here's the deal. Their father knew it. Their father knew about it. But he ignored his parental responsibilities. In 1 Samuel 3.13, God says, For I am about to punish the house of Eli forever for the iniquity that, listen, he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Eli knew what was going on. He heard about it. But he did essentially nothing. I mean, yes, there's one part where he whined a little bit, but he didn't really make any decisive action. Why? Well, you know, I, I'm trying to think about that. Honestly, maybe it's because the descent of the boys was so gradual. Or, or maybe he was afraid that, that they would reject him as a dad if he confronted them. Or maybe, just maybe, he was preoccupied with ministry. Maybe he was in denial and said, oh, it's not that bad. It's just a couple of young guys. Young guys will be young guys. But imagine the regret that he faced at the end of his life. He finds out that his two sons are killed in battle. Their sin went unchecked. And, and the Ark of the Covenant, which reflects the very presence of God, was stolen by Israel's enemy. And Eli knew he never confronted his sons. I still have three fairly young children. Some of you as parents need to be involved with your children. Simply buying them things can never replace your involvement or your time. And some of you have kids that desperately need confrontation. And you, you have either been blind to it or ignored it or not wanted to deal with it. You need to confront. They need to have that talk. So will you do it? You don't want someday when the groom comes back for your regret, your regret to look back on the life of that child and to never have spoken words of affection, words of conflict, and they are dying to hear it. Some of you need to speak those words. For some of you in this area, it's just an area of regret in time. You know, you're so spent after work, you're so spent after commitment that you have very little energy to build into your children or to create memories. 
Another area I struggle with, I do all of them, but particularly this one, is regret elimination in the area of sin. And that's a deceptive one. It's huge. Uh, I deal with this all the time. And don't look at me like that. We're taking it out of the tape anyway. How many of you find that your bad habits in your life just spontaneously go away, right? You used to chew your nails. Uh, you used to call other drivers bad names. Or you would, you know, wave and let them know that you're number one. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day, these behaviors just magically disappeared. So I need to come out and ask you, are there patterns of sin going on in your life that you've not really faced? You've rationalized it, or you think, well, everybody's involved, or this. But you haven't faced them. And if you don't face them, they're going to lead to major regret. Because the groom is coming back. I think about that. Think about Cain. Remember Cain? He wanted to, he wanted to serve God at some level. He offered a, a sacrifice to God, but he was eaten up by unchecked sin. He was destroyed. He was consumed with envy for his brother Abel. And this is a, just a classic text. God says to Cain, Genesis 4, 6, he says, why are you angry? Genesis 4, 6, Taylor. Why are you angry? Sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you. But you must master it. See, I think part of the message that God is saying to us, especially to us who are in Christ, you're not a victim. You're not consigned to the fate of being defeated by sin. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to play itself out that way. Cain, you can choose. Cain doesn't master it. He never deals with his envy. He never deals with his resentment. He never deals with his anger, his bitterness. And one day, all of that just came out into violence. And he kills his brother. And he ends up saying in Genesis 4, 13, my punishment is greater than I can bear. He is hidden from the face of God. He becomes a fugitive. And the rest of his life, he's just, he wanders. So, I got to say to you, and believe me, I'm saying it to me. For some of us, sin is crouching at your door. And if you don't deal with it, it will destroy you. You're thinking, oh, it's just, it's just an internet site. It's just, I know it's fantasy. Mm. It's destroying intimacy. I don't know how to say it any plainer than this. Destructive patterns... Maybe it's abuse, maybe it's addictions, maybe just chronic attitudes. They will wither your spirit. And you have never, never seriously intended to do whatever it takes to stop. Friends, this is the truth. The groom is coming back. The day is coming when you and I are going to say, what the heck was I thinking? Why did I allow that to go on and on and on, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, choking the spiritual life out of me and my family? Why did I not acknowledge the problem and confess it openly and seek whatever help I needed to declare war on it and to do battle to root it out of my life. Let me give you another one. This is, this is not my problem, but it's probably yours. 
the last one was too, too close to home. Uh, another area is risk-taking. You know, God calls us to, to, in a life, he calls us to live a life of adventure, a life of adventure, uh, to take risk. But it had great rewards. I always think of the rich young ruler. Remember, he comes, he goes, hey, I, I, how, what can I do to inherit eternal life? I, I really love your teaching, da, 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 da. And he had this great opportunity. And Jesus said to him, the rich young ruler, he says, okay, here's what you do. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come here and meet us, and we're all going to have an adventure. And he said, no, I can't risk that. This, that's my 401k. That's my security. I'm young now, but I'm going to be old. And this rich young ruler had no idea that he was talking also to a rich young ruler, Jesus, who gave up everything in heaven to serve. God doesn't call you to play it safe and to make life security the number one decision and to always live in our comfort zone. You know, the classic example here are the Israelites. Uh, when they were delivered out of Egypt, out of the hands of Pharaoh, remember, they, went, they crossed the Red Sea. God called them to trust him, take risk for him, and they could have the promised land. And, and this is what they said. Remember, they sent out spies to look at the promised land. That, in other words, the whole thing is culminating into this occupying the land. So in Numbers 13, 31, the verdict comes back from the, the spies. Numbers 30, 13, 31. We're not able to go to the promised land. We're not able to go against these people that inhabit it. They're stronger than we are. And the land we've gone through as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. These people are huge. These people we saw, they're like great size. And we look like grasshoppers in front of them. And the people just wailed. And this is what it says, oh God, why don't we just stay in Egypt? Can you imagine? These are people, this is a whole generation of people, they never went to the promised land. Now friends, imagine the regret. They saw them being delivered from the Pharaoh. They, they experienced all the plagues, the Passover, they saw the parting of the Red Sea. They were being led by a pillar of fire and by a cloud. And they received Ten Commandments. There was like miracle after miracle after miracle. And the promised land is just waiting for them. But they never experienced it. They never got there. They never got to the land of milk and honey. Why? Because they didn't trust God. What that regret factor must have looked like. So here's what I say, particularly some of you who are younger. God may be calling you to a new adventure. I will tell you this, God doesn't always call us to play it safe. So what's God calling you to risk? Maybe it's a vocational deal. Maybe it's an evangelistic deal. Maybe the biggest risk is just going to your neighbor and saying, hi, how you doing? Maybe it's a ministry risk right? You've been asked to serve in a certain part of the church, and, and you say, oh, I, you know, I'm not gifted in that area. I'm not comfortable. That's not my comfort zone. God desires to stretch you, stretch your faith. And the last area, and then we'll stop, is the area of relationships. I really do believe that God has called us to a no-regret heart when it comes to people in our lives. The character in the Bible, I think, is named Saul. Remember Saul? He was the king of Israel. He was looked up to. In fact, it says that he stood head and shoulders above all the other men of Israel. It was told that he was the glory of Israel. And God placed in his life some amazing people. There was a guy named Samuel. And Samuel wanted to be his friend to kind of serve and shepherd him and mentor him. And, and Saul deceived and abandoned him when Samuel spoke some hard words. And he betrayed their relationship. And then God brought another guy, a young boy named David. And, and David could have been Saul's protege. 
David longed just to be Saul's servant. David longed to just be Saul's friend. But Saul was so filled with envy, envy because of David's popularity and the love the people had for him that he tried to kill him numerous times. My point is Saul could have had these relationships, these friendships, this intimate community with these remarkable people with just a single word, one single repentant conversation would have done it. But he never said it. And we're told in Scripture that he died of his own hands and he died alone. So I got to ask you, are you headed down that road toward relational regrets? Some of you have relationships and you need to leave here before you go to bed tonight. You need to go to that person or call that person and say, I love you. Do you know I love you? Some of you may have a lot of relationships. You have a lot of relationships, a lot of acquaintances, but they're all superficial, right? They're like the river, Mark Twain's River Platte, uh, a mile wide and an inch deep. Because nobody really knows you. You wear a mask. And you've never taken the risk of opening up and going deeper with someone. Some of you are in a relationship where there is a grudge that you've carried for years. And pride and unforgiveness rule the day. Today you have to ask yourself that question. Do you want to carry that kind of bitterness into eternity? I don't think you do. You're not a bad person. You're just drifting to what is the easiest. Will you say I'm sorry? And will you forgive where forgiveness is needed? And will you extend it? Would you bow your head? Uh, you don't have to close your eyes. I'd like for you to take out that little bulletin deal. Friends, with your head bowed, life and time, listen, I'm going to tell you, life and time are unspeakably precious, but it's relentlessly short. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't reach the end of your one and only life to be tormented by those words, if only. If only. Because here's the deal. The groom is coming back. We don't know when, but as sure as you and I are here, the groom is coming back. Lord, teach me to number my days that I may present to you a heart of wisdom a life that counted for the kingdom. If you look at the, uh, the card here, uh, at the very bottom, uh, I want you to do this right now. Uh, it says, if only, our regrets. I don't, maybe there's several of these areas that you could check. Maybe all of them. For me, they're, they're pretty much all of them. Uh, parental regrets, sin regrets, something you've kind of nurtured risk-taking regrets. You always play the comfort card, never stretch. Or relational regrets. It's, uh, it's coming. One day, one day a doctor's office will say, the end is near. Don't be filled with regrets. So take that card, rip it off at the bottom, check one, whatever, and then put that card in your purse in your pocket and maybe every evening for the next week just look at it and say what have I eliminated some of those regrets today that's your response